Good afternoon. I'm spot on weather meteorologist Matthew Euler, and welcome to the spot on weather training series titled How the Weather Works. And today we're going to work on part two. We'll go over part two of the training series and with a big focus today on the training um, regarding the different forces that are involved out there in the atmosphere that kind of get the air moving and kind of affect the the air as it moves across the Earth's surface. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing this training with everybody. Um, the image to start today's training video, this is actually what's known as a water vapor satellite image. And the darker areas correspond to drier areas of the atmosphere, while those lighter white, brighter colors translate more to uh, moist air in the atmosphere. So I just wanted to kind of show you what's going on. You know, the atmosphere is a three-dimensional fluid with a lot of various motion going on, uh, not only at the surface where we live with wind, but also higher aloft, higher above the surface where we live. So let's go right into today's training, How the Weather Works, Part 2. Alright, so we're going to start today's training by talking about atmospheric forces, and I kind of alluded to this in the title slide. We're going to start with what's known as the pressure gradient force. Now, what exactly is a pressure gradient force? Uh, this occurs when air is directed from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. And the pressure gradient force, sometimes you'll see the abbreviation, the letters PGF. This PGF, for pressure gradient force, is going to vary directly with the strength of the gradient. Greater pressure differences produce stronger pressure gradient forces and faster movement of air, which we, of course, feel as wind. Now, if we look at the graphic on the bottom of this slide, it helps explain what the pressure gradient force really is all about. By the way, the graphic is courtesy of the weather stem. So, overall, air is always going to be blowing from higher toward lower pressure, and the dark blue solid lines on the graphic at the bottom here, those represent what's known as lines of equal barometric pressure, and those are known as isobars, lines of equal barometric pressure, and they basically, you normally would see them at intervals of four on a weather analysis chart, but in this case, we're showing an interval of two millibars for every solid blue line you see here on the graphic. Uh, blue H representing surface high pressure, the red L, surface low pressure, and look at the direction of the orange arrows and how they are pointing from higher toward lower pressure. At the center of that blue H, that's the highest surface pressure. So air is flowing out away from the highest surface pressure, from high to low pressure, directed there, shown by the arrow direction. Um, in general, the spacing of these isobars, those blue solid lines, really tell us about the pressure gradient for strength. When these isobars are more closely packed next to each other, that is referred to as a stronger pressure gradient force. So when you see these tightly packed isobars, these solid blue lines, that represents large pressure changes over a shorter distance. Now when the isobars, those solid blue lines, become much further apart, uh, we have a more gradual change in the pressure over a horizontal distance and that refers to what's known as a weaker pressure gradient force. So some of the strongest weather systems that we see in the middle latitudes uh, generally correspond to stronger pressure gradient forces, uh, stronger differences uh, in the pressure, let's say, between the center of a low pressure system and the center of a high pressure system. And so we get a lot of wind that tends to blow, especially during the, the fall and the winter time of year. Even in the early spring, we can get some pretty powerful storm systems uh, which, with much larger pressure differences between high and low pressure. All right, now let's move on to a discussion on Coriolis force. Now, Coriolis force is an apparent force, and it generally results from the rotation and shape of the Earth. And as objects are put into motion, such as the wind, uh, th those objects travel on or above a rotating Earth. Now, we've got to think about this. If we're looking down on the Earth from the North Pole perspective, the Earth is rotating counterclockwise. 
So objects are generally going to deflect to the right of intended path of motion in the northern hemisphere due to the Coriolis force and to the left of the intended path of motion in the southern hemisphere. So you'll notice the difference there in the deflection. Northern hemisphere to the right, southern hemisphere to the left. Now changes in magnitude occur as the Earth's latitude changes. And what do we mean by this? The Coriolis force actually becomes stronger as we head poleward or towards the polar areas, higher in latitude. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that the circumference of the lines of latitude, that circumference of these lines of latitude, actually decrease from the equator, where the Earth is much wider and has a much larger circumference, to the poles, where the circumference is much smaller. Now, one important thing to mention with Coriolis force is that it is zero at the equator. Now, why is that important? Uh, it's important for hurricane considerations, for development of these tropical systems, since a spinning motion is generally required for some sort of development, whether we're talking about a tropical depression, tropical storm, or hurricane. We do need some sort of twisting motion, Coriolis force, to occur. Uh, but right at the equator itself, that Coriolis force is zero. That twisting motion is non-existent. And therefore, we really never will see any tropical cyclones developing on the equator itself. Now, the Coriolis force is, again, greatest at the poles. And that, again, has to do with decreasing circumference of those latitude lines as you move you know, northward in the northern hemisphere or towards the south pole in the southern hemisphere. The velocity of a moving object plays into the strength of the Coriolis force. Uh, the velocity of a moving object usually increases as it moves forward due to increasing Coriolis force. And you may have noticed this, some of the most powerful extratropical cyclones or storm systems in the mid-latitudes. As they move north, um, you look at a satellite image and you notice that twisting motion becomes more and more apparent as these systems move northward in the northern hemisphere or southward in the southern hemisphere. Increasing latitude uh, causes Coriolis force to increase. So the, the faster the motion, uh, let's say the wind in this case, the greater the um, apparent Coriolis force. Now the speed of rotation of Earth's axis, by the way, is assumed to be constant. So let's take a look at a couple of graphics to kind of get these points home. The Coriolis force is generally zero at the equator. Now that graphic on the left, instead of Coriolis force, we're calling it Coriolis effect, but it's the same principle. So at the equator itself, the Coriolis effect or Coriolis force is zero. You just have no twisting motion at all uh, at that specific latitude. And then as you go north or south, whether we go north in the northern hemisphere towards the polar area or south in the southern hemisphere towards the south polar area, Increasing with latitude is going to result in a stronger Coriolis effect or Coriolis force. And look at the graphic on the right, showing you the differences in the circumference lines. These are the lines of latitude. But it's showing you as if we're looking from the North Pole down from 90 degrees north latitude downward onto the Earth from the North Pole overhead. You'll notice how these lines of circumference get uh, larger and larger as, for example, 90 degrees north is right at the North Pole, then 80 degrees north. You notice how small that circle is compared to 70 and then 60 and then 50 degrees north. Uh, the circumference is getting wider and wider as we go southward away from the North Pole area. So that, again, kind of ties in with the Coriolis effect, Coriolis force. Another type of force we need to consider which really is more of a balance of forces, is what's known as a geostrophic wind. Now, a geostrophic wind results from the balance between the pressure gradient force, which we just talked about, which is directed from high to lower pressure, or we're on the upper level charts above the Earth's surface, upper level heights. Um, the PGF, or pressure gradient force, is going to be directed from higher to lower heights. And it's also a balance between not only PGF, but also Coriolis force, uh, again, which deflects the air motion to the right of its intended path in the northern hemisphere. So what does this geostrophic wind do? It basically blows parallel to the isobars 
or these height contours, the iso heights, lines of equal height of the upper air charts of a given pressure field. So the wind is blowing parallel to these solid height contours or these isobars above the Earth's surface. Now geostrophic wind occurs infrequently, especially on the Earth's surface, because we have numerous forces that are really throwing the balance off. Um, this includes frictional force. You know, on the surface, the wind is blowing over a solid land mass. Um, you know, different frictional effects between water and land. Um, as, as wind blows towards a mountain, you know, there's, there's some more slowing of the wind due to friction. Additionally, you have geographical features such as those mountain ranges, which really can play into disturbing this balance in order for the geostrophic wind to exist. There's thermal or temperature gradients that also can throw this balance off. And then there's the curvature effects, um, such as the upper atmosphere when you have this upper level trough or these huge upper level ridges. They act, all these numerous forces are going to act on an air parcel. It's going to result in flow across isobars not parallel to them, which again, geostrophic winds, uh, the wind is blowing parallel to the height contours or the isobars. So, um, again, there's a lot of different forces here that are throwing that geostrophic, the balance of the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force off. Geography definitely alters the geostrophic winds. Um, you, you know, mountain areas and the valleys, uh, you have funneling effects, you have wind channeling effects, or even blocking airflow, you know, such as a cold air damming situation east of the Appalachian Mountains. These thermal or temperature gradients introduce another force into the equation of geostrophic balance. When these thermal or temperature gradients and the pressure gradients are not parallel to each other, we have a condition that's known as baroclinicity, where the geostrophic flow changes with height due to the effects of the heating and cooling of an air column. And this results in what's known as a thermal wind. So for that third bullet, just think about this. When the temperature gradients uh, are significant over shorter distances or fairly large over short, shorter distances, that also creates stronger pressure gradients. So a stronger thermal or temperature gradient yields a stronger pressure gradient. And a lot of times the forces are not in balance, so you get some sort of wind that blows across isobars or height contours, if we talk about the upper level above the surface. Um, and that results in an ageostrophic flow. You lose the geostrophic flow, you lose that balance again. Um, heating and cooling of the air column we covered in part one, where um, hotter air columns tend to be taller than cooler air columns, which are shorter. And so that difference in height of the columns uh, also plays into this. Additionally, in the upper atmosphere, we will go way up to the 300 millibar level at 30,000 feet above the ground where we live. We can get this curved flow in the jet stream. Um, which introduces something known as centripetal acceleration. Now, centripetal literally means um, a force that's acting inward towards the center of rotation, and this results in a gradient wind. So let's take a look at this. Uh, initially, what we have is um, a pressure gradient force on the graphic there on the left-hand side of the slide. Uh, you have pressure gradient force denoted by that solid green arrow going from higher toward lower uh, pressure or heights. Um, the Coriolis force is going to act to the right or 90 degrees to the right of the air parcel motion. So as the air parcel tries to move from the higher toward lower heights, um, there's going to be a deflection of the air parcel to the right of its attendant path. That's the Coriolis force. Uh, eventually balance is reestablished in the form of the Coriolis force and the pressure gradient force being equal and opposite in direction to each other. And this will then result in that balancing and the reestablishment of what's known as that geostrophic wind blowing parallel to these solid height contours. All right, and you see a lot of this, um, this balance of forces or non-balance of forces when we talk about these jet streaks or jet maxes which we have accelerated wind moving through the jet stream axis, um, that can actually throw the balance off temporarily. Graphic on the right shows curved flow. Now this would be an example of curved flow. Um, in, in the northern hemisphere, this would represent a trough of lower pressure. 
Um, in general, we have, again, we're talking about the surface now over there on the right-hand side graphic. So we have that red arrow, which is our pressure gradient force, um, directed from high toward low pressure. And then we have the Coriolis force um, turning that wind, turning that wind or that air parcel motion to the right of its intended path. Um, additionally, now we're introducing something known as centrifugal force. Now, centrifugal force is, an, is a force that acts outward away from the center of rotation of a curve. We talked about centripetal acceleration. That acts inward toward the center of, of rotation of a curve. But centrifugal force acts outward away from the inside of that curve. Right, so with gradient winds, we talk about air parcels entering curve flow. We have centripetal acceleration acting inward towards the center of the rotation. Uh, think about when you drive a car around a hairpin curve. You know, think about that. The tighter the radius of curvature or the tighter that hairpin turn or curve, uh, the greater the pull outward you're going to feel. That's that centrifugal force. So think about this, just coming off driving a car, coming off the exit ramp, and you got a really tight uh, curve there, the exit ramp, all right? Um, you're gonna have a couple forces acting on your motion of the car. You're gonna have centrifugal force, which is going to be acting outward away from the center of the curve, and that's that force you feel. Now, the faster you accelerate around that curve coming off the interstate, the stronger that force is going to pull you outward away from the center of the curve. Um, and that's why there's speed limits, slower speed limits posted uh, there for the hairpin curves when you're driving on the road. You know, your speed limit may drop down to 10 to 15 miles per hour because the curves are so drastic and the forces are acting so hard. If you were to drive at 50, 55 miles per hour around these curves, you most likely would go off the road because centrifugal force would pull you um, outward away from the inside of the curve and you would go off the road. Centripetal acceleration, that is again referring to changes uh, in the direction of the air parcel's motion. Uh, it generally occurs in curve flow parallel to isobars um, or height contours on upper level charts. And again, the centrifugal force acts outward away from the center of the curve. Now, additionally, we have friction, geography, and those thermal or temperature factors that can produce winds that tend to deviate from this gradient wind and flow across the isobars from higher toward lower pressure. Here is a look at the gradient wind, a graphic. Um, in general, we have two types of winds when we talk about gradient winds. Uh, we generally have subgeostrophic associated with troughs, um, which is located there on the left-hand side. And then the upper right-hand graphic represents a supergeostrophic situation um, where there's a balance of forces. You can see how many forces are involved in this gradient wind balance. Gradient, I just want you to think about uh, wind flowing around curves, okay? Similar to you driving around a curve. Um, so in general, with a gradient wind balance, what happens is we have near a trough or area of lower heights in the atmosphere or lower pressure, the wind is generally going to slow as centrifugal force is going to act outward away from the center of the curve um, in conjunction um, with the Coriolis force. So near a trough, the wind slows down, similar to what you do when you come off the interstate and we talk about that very tight curve, that tight exit ramp. You're, you slow down in your car, right? Um, and so the same thing happens in the atmosphere around this trough, the cyclonic curvature. Uh, wind is going to slow as centrifugal force is acting outward, adding to Coriolis force. Eventually, we get a reestablishment of equilibrium of the forces or balance of the forces, and that results in that geostrophic wind once more. The graphic on the right-hand side shows near a ridge uh, how winds tend to speed up as centrifugal force is now opposing the Coriolis force. So they're acting opposite in direction to each other, centrifugal outward force and the Coriolis force. Um, so there's your big difference. Overall, it's a very big balancing act in the atmosphere for the air parcels to reach equilibrium. Um, everything wants to reach a state of equilibrium in nature in general. And so this is, these are the actions and these are the different forces 
that act upon air parcels as they move into troughs and into ridges. With centrifugal force, again, this acts outward or opposite to the centripetal inward directed acceleration and curve flow. And air parcels generally move with a gradient flow pattern. They react like a driver of that car that I have mentioned, traveling in a curved path, experiencing centrifugal force. Um, the faster you go around a curve in the car, the greater that centrifugal or outward directed force. Now for high pressure systems, centrifugal force acts in the same direction as pressure gradient force. And for lows, just like we talked about troughs, it acts in the same direction as the Coriolis force. So putting all the forces together, there's a lot of balancing going on in the atmosphere. It's invisible to us. We don't see it with our own eyes, but it truly does exist. If you look at the graphic on the left, um, balance of forces in the northern hemisphere, PGF represents pressure gradient force, um, COR in this case is the Coriolis force, um, CENT is the centrifugal uh, force, and there's a lot of different moving parts here. The blocks, by the way, of the graphic on the left represents an air parcel. Okay, so in general, there's a lot of different reactions and speed of the air parcel, um, whether, you know, we're talking about pressure gradient force is being balanced by Coriolis force. That's when we have geostrophic balance. As I mentioned, that geostrophic wind. Um, when we get cyclonic gradients versus anti-cyclonic gradients, a lower versus higher pressure, um, you kind of see what's going on there, how centrifugal force um, acts opposite in direction to the uh, Coriolis force. A graphic on the right shows surface pressure features. Blue H represents high pressure. Red L represents low pressure. And surface friction really does play an important role in the speed and direction of surface winds. Um, as a result of the slowing down of air as it moves over the ground, you know, friction really acts opposite to the um, direction of motion of the air parcel. Um, so it tends to slow the winds down. As winds blow across the Earth's surface, it gets slowed by this friction. And winds are less than would be expected from the pressure gradient as a result. Uh, friction also causes the air to flow across the isobars at an angle. So we talk about you know, high pressure to low pressure, pressure gradient force. Um, in order for balance to be achieved, and we have to take into account the reality of friction um, as well as that you know, the effect of slowing the wind speed down means a lesser Coriolis force um, and then the reestablishment of, uh, of wind flowing across the isobars. All right, that wraps the training up. Part two of how the weather works. We went over some interesting terms today. We talk about forces in the atmosphere. We cannot see these forces <clears throat> but they're very important in determining motion um, into and out of upper level troughs and ridges, um, the wind flow on the surface. We started with a overview of the pressure gradient force, uh, which is a force directed from high to low pressure areas. Um, and in general, the tighter the packing of these isobars or lines of equal pressure, the stronger the pressure gradient force and the stronger the wind speeds. We talked about Coriolis force, how it's an apparent force due to the rotation of the Earth primarily. Um, as the Earth rotates beneath a moving object, it's going to deflect to the right of its intended path in the northern hemisphere and to the left of its intended path in the southern hemisphere. And we also talked about Coriolis force is directly proportional to an object's velocity, uh, its speed. So the faster an object moves, the stronger the Coriolis force. The slower an object moves, the weaker the Coriolis force. And we talked about how circumference decreases as we gain latitude, whether we're talking the northern or southern hemisphere, and therefore Coriolis force increases with latitude as we have decreasing circumference of the latitude lines as we move towards the poles. Additionally, we talked about the importance of Coriolis force being zero at the equator, which is important as far as where hurricanes develop. Uh, you generally need to be poleward of generally five, or I'm sorry, equate, poleward of the equator, um, at least five degrees north or south latitude, in order to really get that existing spin. The Coriolis force kicks in at five degrees north and five degrees south. Anywhere uh, between the equator and the five degrees north and south, um, Coriolis force is going to be negligible. 
It's not going to allow that spinning motion we need for tropical cyclones to really get spun up and developed. Additionally, we talked about the geostrophic wind, which is just simply a wind that blows parallel to height contours. Geostrophic winds primarily exist above the Earth's surface because friction is not a factor. You get above 3,000 feet above the ground and um, you get the establishment of this geostrophic wind. Uh, and again, it's a balance between the pressure gradient force and the Coriolis force. But it can be disturbed through uh, friction if we're talking about the Earth's surface. Um, as well as geographical features such as mountains, temperature gradients, as well as the curvature effects um, with the upper atmosphere, especially the jet stream, the troughs and ridges. Additionally, we talked about uh, just the different forces involved in um, establishing this geostrophic wind. Uh, the nature is seeking out a balancing act here, and uh, when we throw a couple different forces in at the same time, um, nature acts to reestablish that balance and that geostrophic wind. Gradient winds, I want you just to simply think about air parcels entering curve flow. That's when we go into the gradient winds. Um, in general, we talked about um, centripetal acceleration, centrifugal force, um, and it's generally how in troughs and ridges, the air parcel slows into troughs and it accelerates into ridges. There's centrifugal force once more, and we talked about how you can feel this as you're in a car and as you go around the curve. The tighter that curve, or the tighter the radius of curvature, the stronger the centrifugal force will be, uh, which is again why you see the speed limit signs on the road saying, you know, the speed limit is much lesser around curves. Um, if you keep going super fast, the centrifugal force is going to direct you outward away from the center of the curve and possibly off the road. So that's very important. And then there's a summation of all the forces together, whether we're talking about pressure gradient force, Coriolis force, centrifugal force, um, centripetal acceleration. Uh, there's a lot of different things going on in the atmosphere that are very important. Um, one of the biggest things is on the surface, as the wind blows from high to low pressure, it does not blow parallel to the isobars or those lines of equal barometric pressure. It tends to blow across the isobars at an angle due to the effect of friction, which acts to turn the winds across those isobars and actually slows the wind speed down, uh, which then reduces the Coriolis force. Uh, eventually, things become back into balance over time in the atmosphere. All right, I hope you enjoyed the training today. Very, very excited. This is part two, much more training to come. Thank you so much for subscribing to my channel here at Spot on Weather. Looking forward to more fun and more training in the near future. Until then, take care and God bless everyone.